<laughs> Commodity Frontiers uh, from Capitalist into Necrocene, and we have three presenters today. Um, the first one is going to be um, Hane Cotton from Ghent University, the rural Andes between community and commodity. Um, the second presenter will be Justin McBride from the University of Virginia, uh, extermination, extraction, extin extinction, nuclear fracking, and the rise of the Necrocene, and then Martin Arboleda from Harvard University, Planetary Mind and the Modes of Existence of Capital. And so um, I guess since there are three of you, we can do 20 minutes, um, and then we'll have uh, 20 minutes for discussion. And so I'll give you these signals um, when it's appropriate. But we can just get started. Um. Okay, so good morning. Uh, I'm uh, Hanna Kotin from uh, Ghent University. I adapted a little bit the title of my presentation, uh, which is, well, the outcome of um, some previous conversations we had with, um, uh, with Marion Dixon, uh, with whom we brought up the idea to, to talk about um, commodity uh, frontiers, and to especially reflect also on um, the whole question of new frontiers or the actual age of the so-called end of cheap nature. And what I want to do in this presentation is, or my central argument would be about questioning the idea of community survival in the, the age of um, today's globalized uh, world. Um, no. How do I move to that? All right. I just had a, a slight, uh, yeah, technological problem, but that gives us some time to settle. Um, and I hope it works. Yeah. Okay. Now it works. Um, so what I want to do in the, um, in this presentation, well, starting with this uh, picture taken uh, a couple of years ago to, uh, during my PhD research in a tiny village of San Miguel, uh, in the highlands of uh, Bolivia. Uh, where indigenous communities or uh, indigenous authorities are debating their agendas, specifically the organization of land tenure, but always in relation to um, the, the challenges of climate change in their territories and, and natural hazards, intercultural, linked to intercultural education and in indigenous uh, justice um, uh, systems. And these uh, debates and very local, uh, apparently, um, uh, uh, isolated um, in uh, indigenous uh, territories uh, were, well, the, the material I worked with during my PhD uh, research, which is the starting point of a new research project I'm currently working on. I recently, um, I just came, uh, came from the field in Bolivia and Peru, uh, where I'm taking insights from that research uh, towards a more comparative uh, perspective on uh, the position of these, um, of these communities within uh, and, uh, a globalizing uh, world. And what I want to do in this presentation is share the broad outlines of that new research project um, and link it to some first insights, but mainly some uh, a lot of new questions brought up uh, by uh, this this new research and the first uh, the first ideas I got uh, from the field and from the archives I just visited. 
Uh, this presentation departs from, uh, from central paradox in historical capitalism to make an argument about the supposed survival of rural and particularly indigenous territories as free or conserved uh, reserves of cheap nature. And it takes us to the Andes uh, with a focus on land rights uh, as a, taken as a, com uh, as a commodity frontier, uh, <coughs> particularly from the 19th centuries uh, on. I'm, I'm focusing on how this uh, commodity frontier seeks to advance in the Andean highlands and the struggles it provokes and the repercussions these have on the longer term to understand new questions on uh, advancing commodity frontiers uh, into today's so-called surviving margins uh, in the 21st uh, century. Uh, so first of all, I start with this, um, with this paradox of, um, of historical uh, capitalism, which I situate between the great commodification and the survival of commodity-based um, uh, systems or the production of a apparently homogeneous uh, space of, of commodity production and the reproduction of communal land, uh, uh, of commun uh, communal land control. Uh, as the 21st century takes off, the issue of, communi of community lands is being pushed back on, on the global development uh, agenda. Uh, and recent findings and, and, and new projects, initiatives, um, have been working, have been try or trying uh, today or currently to uh, visualize, to make, it to make more visible the, um, the actual significant uh, existence of these uh, communally, uh, communally managed uh, lands. Recent findings uh, demonstrate that a surprisingly large share, large share of the world's lands area about at least 50% of, uh, of the world's lands area is held currently under customary systems by indigenous and peasant uh, communities across all world uh, regions. Uh, these, this is a map elaborated by a project called the Landmark Map, uh, which is a, it's, it's a, it's a project in, in process uh, through interactive uh, mapping where communities and uh, organizations worldwide are, uh, are uh, visibilizing these uh, communally managed uh, uh, lands on, uh, on, on an interactive world map. Um, in the search for the last reserves of non-renewable resources, these communally land mani uh, managed lands, uh, often without or with very weak uh, legal protection, are becoming vulnerable uh, targets of land appropriations and uh, become the, the scenery of, uh, of increased uh, uh, social conflicts. Uh, but still, um, we can uh, uh, we are confronted with a significant amount of uh, of land managed by communities in in today's uh, on today's planet, and this stands in uh, contrast with how world historical processes of land commodification have effectively uh, pushed land and resource management in many localities under statutory laws and into exclusivist proper property titles. Uh, what I want to say is that what, what we are actually observing is not or has not to be read uh, in, in terms of an opposition or in terms of separate worlds, but rather uh, as a coexistence in terms of a dialectics uh, between commodity production and community uh, reproduction. Um, is both, um, so how both uh, an, an, uh, an apparently homogeneous uh, expanding world of commodity production and an apparently external world of community autonomy uh, are the product of uh, joint processes of incorporation and resistance. So instead of forgotten leftovers, these customary and communal governance st structures must be understood in connection to world historical processes of commodity production. In, an, in order to understand and explain this paradox, um, I think the concept of commodity frontiers and frontier zones uh, is quite useful. Um, commodity frontiers understood as the process of land uh, labor and nature, incorporation and appropriation, but also understood as a very, as a spatial process or as a um, spatial expression of these, of these incorporation uh, processes. Um, and I particularly look at land and the question of land rights. Although land is a fictitious uh, commodity, I, I, for me, it, it's very helpful to look at uh, land rights and the transformation of land rights as a commodity uh, frontier. And actually, one of um, a very significant frontier in the his in in the in the process of historical uh, capitalism. It concerns a necessary transformation of the relation to the land, 
to enable expanded commodity uh, production. Um, I also relate here to the concept of frontiers of land control elaborated by Paluso and Lund, uh, where, where this, um, to, which helps to explain uh, changes in land regimes and related uh, land conflicts as the recreation of frontiers of land control where authorities, sovereignties, and hegemonies are challenged by new enclosure, territorializations, and property regimes. So frontier processes uh, shape new spatial constellations that must be understood as zones of negotiation, where these, these, this transformation of land rights is constantly being negotiated and renegotiated. Um, so what I want to do in the following is um, trace this, uh, this process, uh, this, this commodity frontier into the Andean highlands uh, in an area where communities seem to have survived historical capitalist developments and state formation mm -hmm. and whose land seems to persist at the other side of the market and the state. Um, the Andes is an eliminating illustration of this commodity com community paradox. Uh, the rural Andes is composed by predominantly agrarian societies where a considerable part of the total land surface, uh, actually about 30%, uh, is either des designated for the communities or held collectively by communities. Uh, my own research zooms in on the Andean highlands on the Altiplano, which is a, a vast area ecosystem located entirely above 3,500 meters uh, at both sides of the Peruvian and the Bolivian border uh, in the heart of the Andean uh, region. And my current research focuses on, zooms in on two areas, uh, the Puno area in Peru and the Oruro area um, in, um, in Highland uh, Bolivia, which are two regions uh, marred by uh, relative isolation and lack of ecological conditions, which seem to be the key, um, uh, or which, which are taken generally as the, as the key um, factors to understand and explain the strength of communal uh, arrangements. Uh, these are areas marked by a very harsh climate, unfertile, unfertile soils, and very strong indigenous uh, present, uh, presence um, uh, and, and uh, communal um, uh, <coughs> organization, um, communal structures at, uh, at the village level. Um, however, what, um, what really interests me in this, um, in, in this uh, research is, uh, besides these uh, ecological, demographical, um, uh, similarities, there's a very um, uh, strong uh, difference in terms of these, um, uh, the, the formal organization of these, uh, of these land rights um, due to the, the, um, the national histories of both countries, where we have uh, in the last decades um, the, uh, the, the strengthening and also the political empowerment of, of indigenous communities under the government of Evo Morales versus a very strong neoliberal state in, um, in Peru, um, which, are, which is a very strong divergence we know t today, but which has a much more uh, longer uh, and even pre-independence uh, 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 legacy in which I want to uh, delve more, but for which I, for the moment, are still confronted with more questions than, uh, than really clues related to this, uh, this, the land question and the indigenous question in, in both countries. Um, both of these regions have a long history of political and economic uh, interaction within a shared single socioeconomic zone, without which we cannot understand the history of, of capitalism. Um, over the centuries, indigenous peasant communities of the Andes have defended, asserted, and reinvented their communal autonomy in the context of, markets, um, the context of, uh, of market expansion and state formation. The proce this process started during the 16th century commodity revolution that linked the Potosi silver mines to European capital and empire. In function of the appropriation of new resources of cheap nature, uh, rural settlements were restructured under the Reducciones reforms of Viceroy Francisco de Toledo in the late 16th century to facilitate the extraction of labor and natural resources um, in the Andean uh, region. These new arrangements broke the territorial logic along which uh, a community life was organized uh, in function of the opening of, um, of, vital commodity, of a vital commodity frontier. This resulted in the emergence of a South Central Indian socio-economic space uh, with the silver mines of Potosi at its core. The Potosi frontier caused both um, 
the destruction of socio-ecological arrangement, but also the creation of new socio-ecological um, arrangements to the, the uh, active uh, destruction and delegitim delegitimization, uh, they're not completely eliminating uh, pre-existing uh, arrangements. So these new colonial arrangements, um, however, made community control functional to the appropriation uh, of cheap nature. Local communities were incorporated under the homogenizing category of Indians as vassals of the king, implying the current protection of local collective land systems sealed by the sale of written land titles. In turn, for fiscal loyalty on the part of those communities in the form of labor, species, and money. This asymmetrical mutual relation has been coined by Tristan Platt as a state community reciprocity pact. It plays a heavy burden upon indigenous communities, but at the same time, it was appropriated by these communities as a crucial instrument in defending communal land claims once the post-colonial state attempted to unilaterally break this pact. And I'm, my research has particular interest in this whole very violent, conflictive process of breaking the, the colonial pact. Um, and this brings us to the 19th century, a crucial period at a global level for the advance of frontiers uh, of, land, of land rights commodification, um, when new ideas from the 17th, 18th century on uh, started to uh, evolve and, and uh, uh, gain importance, um, constructing this myth of private property as the key to, uh, to national progress uh, and capitalist transition of, of uh, nation states. Uh, and also in, Indian, um, in the Indian countries, um, this was a very powerful uh, discourse or narrative that was taken up by uh, the new emerging uh, elites in the now independent countries, particularly by uh, El Libertador Simón Bolívar, uh, whose decrees of 1824-1827 uh, set the outlines of a framework for, uh, of a legal framework that would allow um, the principle of private property to, to act as a basic condition for the free movement of goods uh, and labor. So this implied that the, the, commun the state community pact could not longer uh, be hold. Um, communities, communal structures had to be, were effectively by, by law eliminated um, uh, in order to, um, uh, to replace them by, by private, okay, I have to <laughs> hurry up. Um, but these interesting, these, uh, these legal, these liberal land reforms only uh, were implemented or could uh, have effect uh, about half a century after, uh, after Bolivar, when new commodity frontiers were, um, were seeking their way into these Andean uh, territories. And here, Pun both Puno and Oruro were quite important regions. Puno, Oruro for the tin mining uh, industry, and Puno as a, as a key center of wool production for uh, the English, uh, the English dominated international wool market. The outcome of these implemented liberal law, um, land reforms, however, was very, uh, uh, was very uh, contradictory, um, um, actually producing much more an expansion of semi-feudal uh, land uh, relations in the form of the haciendas, which uh, appropriated or absorbed indigenous communities and converted these uh, this indigenous peasant into uh, semi-enslaved tenants. But in the sea of haciendas, several community enclaves uh, of considerable extension uh, persisted. These enclaves um, seem like, uh, or appear as spaces that seem to have been overlooked by those advancing commodity frontiers. Uh, they seem to be situated beyond the frontier. Uh, and the ab apparent Im immobility of the frontier in these regions is gen generally explained again by these un by unattractive ecological uh, conditions and the dominant indigenous population. While these factors are indeed key to the lack of economic incentives, a closer look at the in interactions between communities, the state, and private actors at the time reveal a much more dynamic picture. Um, in the context of advancing frontiers, indigenous communities sought to renegotiate the conditions of their incorporation and the limits of this, uh, of this state community pact, and in that way to safeguard a minimal level of autonomy. So they searched to detain the production of cheap nature and to, by preventing the appropriation of communal structures by um, uh, these uh, advancing, uh, and this expanded uh, commodity uh, production structures. 
the repertoires of reaction of highland communities to detain the conversion of communities into cheap nature can be roughly classified along three lines. Um, communities and their leaders uh, deployed a triple strategy coordinated and strengthened by an ambitious indigenous mestizo uh, alliance through which indigenous communities uh, sought um, to use the existing legal frameworks and particularly colon the colonial legacy of this, uh, of this state community pact, this fiscal loyalty, um, uh, organize um, at national level uh, to lobby for different laws, but also to openly um, uh, deny the laws and, and, and uh, as a last resort, re resort return to violent uh, rebellions. Um, the result of this was that those, so these, these enclaves um, uh, could, could exist and could persist only through uh, compromise and processes of cooptation with, in alliance with mestizos and in negotiation with, directly with the state. Um, and empirical research on both, re on both case regions that demonstrate that the end of communal land control in some of these communities did not equal its replacement by cap capitalist property relations, nor did the persistence of this communal land control result, uh, result from isolation from supra-local changes in market and state integration. And this influenced the course in late